Hi everyone, I'm Kushi, the host for this session of the edX Pixel 360 Virtual Expo. So I'm extremely excited about today's first webinar on macro photography. We're joined by a very talented and accomplished group of underwater photographers. Today I'm here with Simon Lorenz, Brett Lobwin, Susan Meldonian, and our moderator for today, Ellen Lowe. So before we begin, let me just quickly introduce them. Uh, Simon is an underwater photographer whose photos and articles have appeared in magazines all around the world, and he has filmed for CNN and NetGeo. He supports various NGOs and fights for the protection of sharks on the advisory board of the Hong Kong Shark Foundation. Next, Brett is a passionate and environmentally minded photographer, and he aims to represent marine life in its natural element without demonizing or sensationalizing an animal to gain attention for the wrong reasons. He's a strong advocate of protection, of protecting our oceans by raising awareness around the impact of single-use plastics. So Susan is a photojournalist socializing in underwater and nature photography. Her images have been seen in many publications and she has published two photo ID books of the strange and unusual marine life found at the Blue Heron Bridge in Florida. Susan has also won multiple prestigious awards for her work. And finally, our moderator for today, Alan Lowe, is a commercial photographer based in Hong Kong and a scuba diving aficionado. He has been selected as one of the world's top 50 underwater photographers under Blanc Pan's 50 Fathoms. So now I will pass it over to Alan to begin this wonderful panel with our talented photographers. The floor is yours, Alan. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. This is Alan in Hong Kong. Welcome, Susan, Brad, and uh, Simon. Alan. Hey, Alan. Hi. Welcome to ADEX Virtual Expo 2022. I'm Alan Lowe, and uh, we are talking about macro photography today. My screen is jammed. Alan, you try to click onto the arrow. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. So this is myself. Um, my portrait photo. Okay. Uh, just to quick introduction of myself. I've got selected in uh, 2015 in uh, Blanc Pang, uh Edition 50 Thetoms, and myself uh, specialize in um, underwater macro photography. I'm an ADEX uh, ambassador in macro photography and a CCAM photographer, and a member of the Ocean Artist Society in the US. This is uh, myself on location in Mexico some time ago. Uh, while I'm at work, but uh, unfortunately, this photo doesn't show I'm having a macro lens. It's a wide angle pot. Okay, and this one is the mimic, uh, sorry, it's a, a coconut octopus taken in Land Bay Street. And uh, it's a marine behavior shot. You can see the tentacles is stretching. And uh, the octopus itself is a uh, taking the shell, two pieces of shell from the sandy bottom and to take it as a, at his home to protecting himself. And this one is the mantis rim carrying eggs. Uh, this is a kind of a very difficult shot. Why? Because uh, the mantis rim itself, usually carrying the eggs, always hiding himself very rare will come up to show himself. So it's a kind of rare shot and also it's a lucky shot taken in uh, Indonesia land bay. This one is a 
baby squid inside the eggs. Because for my own preference, I like to take behavior shots rather than the, we call it ID, ID shots. This is the book cover for the Blanc Pang art book 2015. This is the cover shot. This is a uh, uh, saw blade swim on the piece of uh, hard coral. This is a flamboyant cuttlefish inside the eggs. Almost about to hatch out. This one is the goby, guard, guarding the eggs. Oh, this one. <clears throat> you will see two critters here, two animals here. It's the little fish, tiny little fish, and the baby mantis. Obviously, this hole is a beer bottle. They are fighting, those two, they are fighting for the home. We'll see whoever can get in. This is a robust ghost pipe fish. The one in front <clears throat> near to the camera. This one is the female one is carrying eggs. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a pregnant. Most of the shots I've taken, I've been using a snoot, like a spotlight. This one considered is a super macro shot. Uh, as everybody knows, Pygmy Seahorse is very tiny in, in size. The height is about three to four millimeters in height. Yes, thank you. That's my uh, finish of my presentation. Thank you. And next one, next speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Susan from US, Florida, right? Yes, and I have to put this back in the presentation mode. There we go. Oops. Okay, I need to share. Hold on one second. Okay, where is it? Here it is. Okay. Well, so I, I'm not sure uh, what kind of things people want to know about. So I put some of my ideas together for people um, on my ideas and basic rules of thumb for uh, underwater macro. Uh, I like to isolate my subjects uh, I'd like to seek good negative space. I like to use lines, uh, diagonal lines to make your eye walk through the photograph. Um, and I like to find a tight focus uh, on the eyes in particular or the mouth, whatever it is that's the, the main subject. But I like the eyes to be looking at me. Um, I'm good color. I'm always amazed by images that the background is you know, other than black. I've been doing a lot of black water photography, so everything's got a black background in that, but I do love to have uh, colorful backgrounds because the ocean, when you look at it, is blue. Um, and I love behavior shots. Alan, I love your photographs. Um, and yours is uh, I love everyone, but that was, that was a nice presentation. Um, I like to photograph some a regular subject, but in an unusual way. And I think that also changing your point of view, I mean, it's, it's a big deal if you can just photograph something and get it in focus because the ocean's moving, the camera's moving, the water's moving, the animal is moving, and there's a lot going on. And you've got to try and freeze the frame of, of what's happening. So uh, once you get all that down, you try to look at the point of view um, you try to avoid distractions. You try to make sure that you're not photographing 
garbage in the, you know, or, you know, just trash that's in the picture, you, unless that's the subject. But also you can use your background uh, to, to enhance your yeah. composition. And I like to anticipate the comp composition ahead of time. If I see something, I'll, sometimes I'll just find a nice pretty background and then use that to, uh, uh, and, and wait till something comes into frame. So for here, let me just, now here's where I took, it's a crab, but it's an unusual subject. I mean, it's a regular subject, but I took it to photograph in an unusual way. And this took me about a whole roll just to get this shot. <laughs> um, let's see. This is a starfish. And when I say taking a starfish, you know, it's a regular, we see starfish all the time. That they're not that, I mean, you know, they're kind of cool to see, but I wanted to make it look beautiful. So I, I got in really close to get the bouquet background and I just filled the frame with just the foot because I wanted to see what was, it was doing in there. And it, uh, every foot almost seems to have a little eye at the top. So I, I find out interesting find out behavior. behavior. Oh, I'm echoing. A bit. Hey, Susan, I have a quick question. Did you use uh, like a close focus lens for that? Or are you, yeah, just a little bit on the technique? Just a 105. Yeah, beautiful. Well played. Thank you. Um, of course, I like behavior. The last couple of weeks, we were fortunate to find an octopus that was in a, a long uh, metal pipe. And uh, everyone here got a chance to photograph it. And I haven't been diving a lot, so but I finally I said I had to go get out get this photograph. So um, someone was kind enough to show me where it was. And this one, it was actually it kept moving and swirling, and I wanted to capture that motion, but get the center in focus. And that was a real chore, let me tell you. And you can't go taking lots and lots of pictures of the animals. So you've got to sit and wait. And then, you know, you shoot off. What I do is shoot off to the side to see if I've got my lighting the way I want it and then come back and then go over here and then back. Then people were lining up to take the photograph. And there was uh, a lot of people kicking sand up with their GoPros. They don't know what they're doing. So I have to wait for the sand. And I was trying to, you know, cordon people away to, to get the photograph. Um, and it, it's, it becomes a chore, you know, when there's a prize subject. So it's usually better not to let anybody know that there's something there like that. Otherwise, you know, the animal's going to get photographed to death. Unfortunately, with an octopus, after they give, uh, after the, the clutch uh, hatches, the female dies. So it's a terrible thing. But Susan, I, I think I've seen like at least like five or six photographers post regular pictures from this octopus in yeah. uh, New Harvard. It, it, it was. I mean, it seems like thousands of people have photographed this octopus, um, but doesn't seem like the octopus was minding the attention, or did you well, have it? Was in, it was in a very long pipe that was probably four foot long, and it was at the back end of the thing. Um, its focus is to just keep aerating the eggs. I don't think it's really paying attention. Like in my photograph, the eye is behind its legs, you know, some people would wait and, you know, get there early or go during the week or whatever to get the photograph and wait until the eye was in the center and everything was all centrifugal. And that would have been great if I could have. I was more interested in this tattoo look that was going on with the, with the inking of the eggs, you know, the way, and trying to get a couple of eyes in focus and get some symmetry. And I love lines. So anything that's got some it feels you can feel the motion in this one and that's why I like this this particular image uh, and yeah everybody in this brother photographed it and here is this is a hairy blenny and I photographed this with a snoot um, uh, the the uh, backscatter snoot um, which was my first time ever using that snoot and um, actually that was one of the easiest snoots I've ever used it was really a lot of fun um, and one of the key things that you want to focus on is getting the eyes as close as, as, as in focus as you can and learning the depth of field on your with your camera your your rig your setup your lens whether you're you know 
well, four thirds or your, you know, um, full frame or not full frame, you know, you have to learn your camera and spend, spend time, spend the whole day just taking pictures of one thing until you learn that camera inside and out. And that's really one of the best things you can do for yourself. Now, this is one of my black water shots. And this, of course, is out in the middle of the ocean. We go out here in the Gulf Stream Current and uh, we go out over depth. It's about 700 to 1,000 feet below us. So there is no reef. And if you drop something, you'll never see it again and you can't chase it. Um, and if a subject decides to take off because it sees your lights and it, it darts down, you can, your ears are gonna get a workout. So um, I've been doing black water for the last five or six years. And um, this is a sea angel and it was actually spawning these eggs. Um, and I, I, I couldn't believe my luck because I just never thought I would get to see this. And it, I saw this little tiny, the sea angel, they're really tiny. They're probably between the size of a grain of rice to the size of two grains of rice long. And uh, it's, it's quite something to, to try to photograph. And this was just kind of hovering and almost attached to this, you know, um, clutch of eggs, which was amazing to me. And I took several pictures of it and it never left, it just stayed there. But normally if you see a sea angel, they, as soon as they see the lights, they take off and, they, and, and they're fast, they're wicked fast. They, one of your biggest struggles with uh, blackwater photography is the speed at which everything is going. And you have to be ready to go and keep that finger trigger happy and, and be in focus constantly to get your shots. And this is another blackwater shot. I love jellyfish. I could photograph, put a jelly, me and jellyfish, I could be happy all day long trying to get all, all of the detail in these, um, in the, tentacles. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to photograph this and I finally got it and I was just tickled silly, you know, getting all the little, the dotage, I call it, you know, where you see all the little speckles. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge to do this kind of uh, work. You have to wor worry about your, your buoyancy. You have to make sure that you're not sinking like a rock. You have to watch your gauges. You have to watch your depth and you, then you have your ears and you know, sometimes you'll see something, it'll, it'll poke for the surface and you, you can't rush that because your ears are going to give you a, they're going to argue with you. And, and this, uh, again, is black water also. This is uh, a, a, a little uh, nautilus. It's a female and it's running. This is a salp underneath here. And it's, it almost looks like it's running on a, a wheel like a hamster. But, uh, and the little ears here are the signal that this is a female. So it's a female nautilus that hasn't grown its shell yet. And the female nautilus has the shell and the male uh, doesn't. And uh, she has that, so she has a place to put her eggs and she can go up and go down. And the male stays small and the females uh, get a little bit bigger. I love this kind of picture when it's like, it, it looks like something else. Obviously it's not running on a treadmill here, but it does look like that. It really looks like a circus act. That's really right? cool. I, you know, I, I mean, I, in some pictures I've erased all of the jazz in yeah. the background because I find it distracting. And, uh, but you know, I've left it in for uh, contests and whatnot. That's because there's, sometimes it's just fascinating. There's so much more, there's usually nine things happening at once, and your job is trying to focus on one. Now, this is another uh, another snoot shot, and it's of a jawfish. And uh, one of the things I love to photograph, probably more than anything else, is to try and capture the spirit of an of an animal, and to get that sincerity or get an expression that it's making. You know, I mean, these fish can look very angry and, and very pissed off because they've got a mouthful of eggs and, you know, they're usually stuck there. And, and this, this one looked like, well, please, please don't take my picture. <laughs> so it just, it, it spoke to me and I had to, I wanted to throw that in there because uh, I, I just, in both of its eyes, getting both their eyes in focus is a problem for most lenses, unless, unless you're the right distance or have the right lens for that animal. And I was thrilled that I got both the eyes in crisp focus. 
And then this one I have to throw in there because during COVID we couldn't go diving. So um, I went in the pool to try out some ideas and I was getting uh, buzzed by these bees kept going over my head and I'd have to dip down and they, and they were like almost attacking me. And I thought, this is crazy. So I got underneath the water and went and got the tank, you know, and I got under the water and I had the tank going behind me and I just laid there and then the tank wasn't working because the bubbles were blowing everything away. So then I went, I got a snorkel and I just sat there with the snorkel and this bee came down and, and it buzzed around in a circle and it was just coming to, just screeching to a halt and, uh, and, and it died. <laughs> so they were dying. They were using the pool as their burial ground. Who knew? You know, this is going on all day long. You know, unless you're paying attention to something, you don't know what's happening. So, but, so uh, actually, some of uh, one of the photos that I'm going to have uh, in my presentation, I actually it was photographing seahorses and I got stung on the face by a bee in the water. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> so, oh. That, that image to me, it evoked a whole different emotion, getting stung on the face and then blowing up. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they evoked an emotion. <laughs> We're true. afraid of bees. I'm, I'm, I'm allergic to bees, so I, I, was, I was afraid it was going to fly into my snorkel. So I, I, didn't, you know, I was just waiting to suck one of those things down, and then, then what was, gonna, what was I going to do? But it was so cool because I, I couldn't believe I got the photograph and then it came out you know, in focus. And I mean, this took me hours, hours. Of, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I tried to photograph this and uh, to get it in focus. And just as it starts to die, it gets bubbles. So it lands. I have other photographs and there's no bubbles on them. And then like within a minute, they start to develop these bubbles. So, you know, there's, there, there's behavior going on around us everywhere. And then this is a conch. We have a uh, the West Indian fighting conch that come in here and they do this whole spinny thing and they, they come in to, uh, uh, they migrate here to, uh, to spawn. And I've never seen one out and I've never seen one have a face. I've never seen a conch with a face. I've seen the two eyes and the shell my whole life. I've been in the underwater, for, doing underwater photography 30 years. This is the first time I saw the whole animal out and it was alive and kicking, and I didn't know they could do that. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, my name is Susan Meldonian. I have discovertheoceans.com and uh, Nightpoint Photographics. And thank you very much. And I guess now we shall turn it over to Simon Lorenz. Me? All right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get to introduce Brett. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. That's some really cool pictures that I'm very jealous of. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Simon. I'm uh, also an underwater photographer, amongst other things. We also have to be jacks of many trades, so we do lots of different things. We teach, teach photography, teach diving, um, uh, you know, write articles. Now I'm doing uh, quite a bit of video as well, but uh, my, my main gig is actually uh, running scuba diving trips. Um, that's what I do all the time, uh, which I had to take a big break uh, thanks to a certain disease. Uh, but uh, we're starting back now. So I'm finally getting some new footage again that is shot from outside of Hong Kong because I am German, but I actually live in Hong Kong, bizarrely. And um, uh, we do have macro photography here as well. Uh, and so that's pretty much the only thing I've been doing uh, for the last two years. Um, Wait a minute. German, I thought you were Italian. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's my not very German look, you know. I know I don't really give it the typical German vibe, but uh, that's my Czech mother gave me the dark hair. Um, oh. So, um, yeah, I thought when, uh, when I was asked to present here, I was going to talk about something that I really enjoy in macro photography. So kind of like a topic for today, uh, and that is uh, playing with light. So, uh, you know, with my trips, they're mostly wide angle situations that we get. So I would say sort of 70, 80% of the dives that I do in the year are wide angle. And I do love, you know, the sharks, the whales and all these things. The one thing that is different to macro aside from the lens to me is the ability to play with light. Because when we're lighting up, let's say a shark, you know, the only way we can light them up is from the front, from where we are. Uh, we don't have much alternatives except from maybe from the top, 
perhaps if it's a stingray or something, but otherwise it's always frontal. So if we look at like the picture that Susan has as a background, you know, it's a typical wide angle situation that we have. It's always lit from the front. We can, you know, play around with it a little bit, but we don't have that much options. Whereas in macro, we can control the whole scene. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Sort of the options um, that I really enjoy when we, when we dive with macro in like, you know, Alan mentioned Glen Bay, obviously one of the best places in the world to get like lots of these creatures where you can just sit on the sand with the animal and play with the light and really give all kinds of different directions. So that's kind of the uh, theme of my uh, talk today. Um, so the first one is a picture from a wonderpus uh, taken in Ambon. Um, and I used the snoot, uh, actually the retro snoot, which you can adapt to several um, uh, strobes. Uh, and what the strobe has, it has a, a lens to channel the light, make it stronger, but it also has uh, this cut out piece like a chablon that you can put in and do different shapes. And that day I was practicing square shape. And uh, the reason I picked this as my first image is one thing I really love about the snoot photography is you can highlight um, the subject in a way that you can't do otherwise. And you could never be able to do it in wide angle. It's very, very difficult to do that in wide angle. Um, and if you think of, you know, like Elvis Presley or, or another star, like walking on the stage and, you know, the spotlight follows him. That's kind of what I have in mind when, you know, I do snoot photography. And so here I was trying forever to get something with that square shape, because normally the snoot's always round. And I was like, oh, cool. They've got square, you know, like what can I do to make so I've got some other ones where it looks like somebody's entering a door. Anyway, it is my favorite. Um, but it also shows typical light from above. You know, this is spotlighting the Wanderpus. The Wanderpus has all these funky arms normally uh, that are super pretty, but that's all the Wanderpus pictures have the funky arms in there. Uh, but I really love the, the, the face and the body of, of the beginning of the body, I should say, of the Wanderpus, which is really unique, this sort of, pattern stripes uh, that goes along the body. It's very unique when you look at just that and stop looking at the floppy bits. Um, it's really bizarre. And obviously you can't see that in the photo, but it's pulsating. Yeah? So it's like, it's rolling. These, these stripes are pulsating and it's a bizarre animal, uh, which is why that scientist called it the Wanderpus, which is wonder in German, um, because you know it's such an amazing animal. Anyway, so here I'm lighting from the top, typical spotlight. But one thing that I've been doing a lot is, uh, is backlighting with the snoot. So now you got to get a bit more creative. So you can use the arm. And when I, when I tell people in workshops to, you know, try this out, people are like, well, why, how? Because we just think we have to be shooting from the front. But actually, we can be shooting from all angles. And so here I'm shooting from slightly behind, not quite behind, I'm getting to that in a moment, but this is behind the ribbon eel shooting into sort of the mouth, but, but definitely from behind. And the, the amazing effect that you get is sort of see-through elements like the teeth or these, I don't even know what you call these nostril bits that they have, they really crisp up and they, and they come out. And I particularly love the teeth in this one, but what I also like is this, this outside shine that you get. So it's a silhouette of the animal um, you know, getting created because I'm backlighting it with the snoot. It's complicated. You know, you got to set your camera up. You got to, you got to like put the, put the arm really far out and point the uh, snoot backwards. And, you know, I generally prefer that you practice it on your hand or on a fixed coral or something before you like put this whole apparatus over the animal. But the good thing is with an animal like, you know, like these ribbon eels, they just stay in their hole. And so that's a great one to practice this with because, you know, they, they are actually, uh, you know, permanent basically. And they, they, they will stay there. If they don't like it, they can go in their hole and then, you know, you've ruined it. Uh, this guy was very cooperative. You know, it's great when you've got a cooperative subject that just stays there and almost enjoys the limelight. Um, and uh, you can get this effect. I love this image. Um, for that effect. Um, yeah. one other yeah, hey, Simon, could I ask a couple of questions? So this, this you had it, um, you had the strobe on the arm, you're still attached on, on camera or were you starting to now go into the world of, you know, off camera strobes and all the rest of it? Or is this, this, this still done on arm? I think you mentioned the arm was right out, but. Well, that's a very good uh, point actually, because uh, if you've got a buddy, 
uh, or a dive master. Like if you're diving in Lembe, for example, they're really like reducing the amount of divers. So very often the place that I go just does two divers per dive, uh, two divers per dive master. So you can actually get the dive master to hold it for you, right? And that is quite convenient because that means you can tell, you can get him to guide the light into the area you want, but then you can still change the framing and the angle. And that, that is quite nice. Obviously that's luxury diving. You don't always have that luxury, but when you do, and when you're diving as a buddy team, you can totally unclamp and give the strobe to the other person. Uh, I, I only find what happens is then you start communicating and then you start working and, you know, there's a tiny animal in the middle. You need to be careful that you don't drop your, you know, 20 kilo apparatus right on top of its head, which again, with the ribbon, it would be okay because it could just disappear, but other animals will be harder. Uh, but uh, it, yeah, that's, in this case, I did it with, by myself. Um, but I have done it where you could give it to a dive master. And also some people only have very short arms. I generally go quite generous with my arms because that's really useful if you have the reach. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really weird because like cameras totally lopsided, you know, um, it takes it takes some time. Um, you know, I, so I, I heard a rumor that you traveled everywhere with an assistant that carried your bag from the minute you left oh. your door out of Hong Kong to the dive site. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now the assistant is called Simon. <laughs> and he carries everything really well. He does a really fabulous job at, you know, setting up my equipment for me. And, uh, no, no, that luxury is not there. But, you know, you can definitely buddy up in teams to do that. I find it really difficult to do that because then, you know, you're, you're, cha then you're chasing the light, you know, depending. I mean, if you have somebody who, who even who knows what they're doing, you're still chasing their light. So I found that if I create my own erector set, with extra arms and, and loosen them up just enough so that I can point them where I want on the subject. Then I just have to hope for the subject to stay put, uh, you know, in one, in one particular area and not move around. But yeah. I've also, with the snooting, I've, I'll add a, a second light and I'll turn it so that it's facing outward. And so that I'll just get just the edge and to get that little, see that rim of light you've got on this shot here, Simon? So I'll put it off to the side. Just I don't so remember if I did that here. I do that sometimes as well, just to create like sort of a fake sunlight in the area. But this was, uh, I think also in Lembe, if I remember correctly, and you know, the substrate on the reef is really crappy there. It's, it's not nice. So you really do end up doing these dark shots all the time, which I agree, it does get boring sometimes. Uh, but yeah, no, I do that as well. Sometimes pointing the strobe up or just putting it really far behind and just sort of very gently lighting the area. Um, yeah, no, I do. That. Actually, I'm, coming, I'm going to show one where I am doing the combining images. But before I'm going to show an image, which now that you're saying it, I actually think my buddy Adam Broadbent, who, uh, who uh, started Zoo Blue uh, scuba diving later, uh, I think actually this was a shot where I gave him my uh, snoot. I think so, um, because this is an animal that's not as stationary um, and is moving around. The reason I show this, this is now shooting almost entirely through the animal. I call that X-ray style. Um, and uh, I mean, it's not a shot that you want to do all the time, but it's kind of cool to see um, because you can see sort of the insides of the, 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 the animal, you can see the the, the guts, you can see the eye. Um, I, did, I tried it in Hong Kong when we had ghost pad fish last year, um, and you could even see the eggs uh, in when they're holding it with their fins like that. So um, it's kind of an interesting way to play, but if I remember correctly, actually, I think Adam was holding that, and I was sort of going with the animal and he was following, uh, uh, and that's of course super convenient when you can, when you can do that. Um, Nobody understands me underwater. I can do hand signals all day long. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there's a sand pops up, you know. Um, but you know, the snoot is like such a complicated apparatus, and you know, if you don't use, you have to clip it off, and you know, then you lose parts, and you know, it's quite a bit of stuff. I wanted to show a picture of uh, a, the same effect essentially, but just using my spotting torch. Um, so this is a, a large seahorse in Manado, and um, 
yeah, you know, like they always look the same, these images, you know, it's seahorse, you know, sitting on the ground, doing nothing, you know. And what's really special are these spiky bits uh, all around. This is a thorn seahorse. Um, so I just tried, this is broad daylight, middle of the day, right? So I just tuned the camera all the way down, just put the torch behind, um, and then you just need to play. But again, this is a relatively stationary uh, subject. If if a seahorse is cooperative, it's upright. If it's not cooperative, it's lying on the floor and it's super annoying. But this guy was just fine. And uh, and this is like, you know, like a $40 torch. I mean, this is like the simplest thing. And this picture you could take with a compact, uh, any camera, I would say, um, but you're creating something truly unique. Um, I mean, I've sold prints of this um, and, and that's really not, not difficult to make. It still takes patience and take some editing. Obviously, if it's not super clean, you've got to clean up some things and so on. But it's a super cool effect where, again, something you could never do in wide angle, very difficult. You can only do it against the sunlight, perhaps, uh, unless you go crazy, you know, and, and put some giant lights on the reef somewhere. I don't think you could ever recreate something like that uh, underwater. So, uh, you know, the invitation to everybody to just, you know, use the tools that you carry with you anyway. Spotting torch. I have actually like a little adapter that I put on to make smaller ones for smaller subjects, but this one is big enough to just use a big torch. Right. It's a beautiful here. image, Simon, and it's like you say, like that's unique, you know, like the thousands of seahorse photos, but that I, 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 yeah, I've seen it published and, and everything else, and straight away I know it's yours, right? And that's uh, that, that's that's the trick, right? How do you? There's millions of macro photos being taken at the moment and some beautiful ones, but to truly stand out of the crowd, it needs something like that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty special photo, mate. It's, it really is. Thank you. Um, but like I said, it's easy to make, you know, like it, you know, and then you can do it. I mean, there, yeah, there's some crazy seahorses in the Mediterranean. I'd love to do this technique. You know, the one with the really long, I don't even know what you call these. Yeah. I'd love to do a background light on that one. Anyway, um, here I'm putting it all together. Um, so here I'm using two torches um, to light up the, the bottle because uh, it's quite tricky. You see the, the long arm octopus in there or coconut, I'm not sure which one it is. You can see it in there, but when you shoot it with your normal you know, light, it just looks flat. It doesn't look great. And you want to have that, that factor in that, you know, it's the beer bottle, I think as well. Um, it has a green color, but that just doesn't really come out if you shoot the light from the front. So what I was doing here is like, I, I first took pictures just with the two torches. So I have one torch coming in from the side, shining into um, the bottle body and another one from behind. You can sort of see the second one's light there, but I was really working without the strobe. That's kind of the point that I want to make here. I was shooting without the strobe first um, to try and get the background lighting right. And that makes it also a not dark picture then, right? But primarily I'm making sure this bottle is actually fully lit up. And then I'm putting the snoot just to highlight the face. And, and that's how it kind of all comes together. And that's why I wanted to show this image because, you know, build the stuff up in a row. I always think you should work on your background lighting first um, because you could easily do like a, you know, the torch light that I just did on the seahorse, you could do that first and then still do something from the front. But you always want to do the background first and then add your key subject lighting at the end. So that's how you can control the background or in this case, sort of the subject habitat. And then you, you know, put your highlight onto the, onto the subject. It's, uh, um, I really like this image. Yeah, I love it too. And, and, yeah, you, know, you touch on something. I, I when I when I do like courses, I, I actually try to talk through. Think about a a photo has two exposures. The one that you're going to do with the camera and the lighting that's there, be that uh, constant light or ambient light, and you want to expose for that for your background. And then your second exposure is done with your strobe, and obviously that strobe too can freeze the image as well. So you might have, uh, you know, you've used constant light here to to light up the background you may have used a longer exposure to, to to create a bit of movement in the background and so on and, and pull out a bit more light uh, but then you can actually just freeze that subject which is just your strobe alone right and a lot of people don't realize that you could be shooting one tenth one fifteenth of a second and you can still get a razor sharp image 
by just that strobe opening up for that split second that it does right so yeah i kind of like that notion of you know to to think of two exposures and, and that changes your photography and goes from just yeah nice id photos to very creative photos like this amazing photo from your song it's great yeah, and I mean, you know, we have millions of photos available to practice, you know. Not, Susan started photography when it was still a, a, a role, you know. You had 36 shots per dive, that was it, you know. Um, now we can do thousands of shots in a dive. So just shoot and check on your screen. The other day I was doing a talk with, with Tobias Friedrich, who was, you know, one of the big photographers. And he was like, make sure you look on that screen. You know, you need to zoom in. He zooms in on his camera screen to make sure that the right thing is in focus because that's the worst if you spend all this time and you come home and then you look at it you're like oh that's actually the wrong thing in focus right particularly in macro it happens quite often so you, you need to double check that as well anyway um uh i'm gonna go to the next one which is a different way of bringing a, a light and color in so susan's gonna be happy for this one because because got background lighting even though it's a macro shot and I, I call this one put your hands up for detroit because you know it, it's the uh you know the uh the 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 lure from the uh, uh, orange frog fish is sort of going up and down. Um, and in the back, you've got disco lights. I call this disco bokeh. People call it different things. But essentially what we do is we put something artificial uh, into the background. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but I think it's quite fun to do. Um, so I try to buy like glitter uh, material, but it needs to be something that's actually permanent. So it doesn't come off and you know, ruin the environment. So I usually buy like, I go to like a clothing store or like a costume area or textile where these things are sued on so they don't come off. And I don't buy glued bits. So stuff that doesn't like trail off. And, um, and then I, I clip that to a little slate which you can stick in the sand. And then you need to either use a torch or again, use like a strobe to make these things sparkle and then shoot it with a wide aperture. And then you can get sort of this, this bokeh effect. So this doesn't have any special lens. There's certain uh, lenses like the trio plan that people use, but that's, I think, overkill uh, unless you're you know, doing this for a living. Uh, but this is an effect, again, you could do with any compact camera. I'm also using a snoot again to spotlight the, um, uh, you know, the disco frog, but, um, but the background is just lit with a torch. So um, your options here. Uh, final one is something that, um, uh, that was actually uh, kindly chosen as the poster image, I think because it had a lot of black. Uh, uh, this was actually a chance photo. Um, you know, I just had a 60 millimeter macro on and we were coming back from a night dive in Komodo, pretty mediocre night dive really. Um, and we're swimming back to the boat. I mean, we've already surfaced and then it was like, oh, the boat's there 30 meters or something. So uh, my client, or my guest was like, like snorkeling ahead of me, but I always find it easier just to dive right under the surface. So I'm like swimming and suddenly this tiny little orange thing comes between his legs, you know, and like I immediately knew what it was, never seen it before. I only seen pictures. This is a Pinatus batfish baby. Um, and, uh, you know, it's an insane animal. The fact that it's completely outlined, I mean, it's just insane. The grown ups are also insane, but your photography is kind of limited. It's always the same, you know, all you have is this outline. Some people do like sort of a black shot. So you just see the outline. And other than that, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, it's got a margin. Anyway, what I had always envisioned in my head was if I would ever get to see one of these things, I would do a slow shutter uh, picture uh, because these things wiggle. And the point why they have this outline is that, you know, when you do that in a motion, it confuses predators. They just don't really know what to look at and they'll give up. So as soon as the thing sees you, it will start doing this, which is perfect for slow shutter photography because we can, we can try to get that motion in. But doing that just below the surface and getting the right exposure time, I can tell you is a real tricky uh, task. Took me lots and lots of photos um to to get anything remotely i mean i would have even wanted some more swooshing there if possible uh but it's so hard you need to find your right exposure which was one tenth in this case uh, but then you need to stroke light it uh get that right i ended up actually using one stroke that worked better for me and a quite strong video light so the trailing bit is much better if you've got artificial light in uh because otherwise it, you just will never get the trailing bit in so you need to actually flooded with light so that this trailing bit will be recorded and then freeze it. But then you have to 
be careful not to overpower. It's really tricky. But anyway, it worked out. And this is also light because that is not different light sources. Uh, it is in a way, but it's also deciding how long do I let that light come in and having those effects. So that's why I uh, picked that as my uh, closing shot. Um, and I'd like to thank you guys for uh, you know, paying attention to my part of the talk and invite you to follow me on any of these uh, many beautiful um, social media tags that you can see here. And uh, then I will pass on to Brett. There you go, Brett. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, Simon. Pretty tough to follow those sets of... Um of images but uh I'll, I'll try my best but thanks simon for setting the bar way too high i so oh, i thought no, i'd start with your photo same right? to make me feel good yeah i'm just let, let's talk about this photo again i'm just going to outsource and talk about your photo right now beautiful photo and again um i really love um I'm, I'm playing around a lot with long exposure more in um wide angle uh i really love to play play with long exposure and introduce um introduce stuff there like here we've got weedy sea dragons and so on yeah to me it's it's a really favorite uh, hit and miss technique you can do a lot of photos and trust me they come out just as a blur and you kind of go god i remember taking blurry photos when i first started uh here i am years later and i still can't take a sharp shot so it tests you and, and you've got to continue to adapt and learn so it's really good I wanted to start off with um, maybe try to combine a lot of the, the things that Simon, uh, Susan, and uh, and Alan have spoken about in some images. Is again, you know, how do you create a different element? How do you combine a lot of those techniques of lighting, composition, exposure, and create a unique shot? You know, and one one photo or one subject that I love photographing is squid, and you'll see a lot of my macro photos. Um, that I like to share are generally non-stationary subjects. So it introduces a whole lot of challenges, not, not necessarily just black water as well, but in a lot of different parts of the ocean, I like to shoot moving subjects. Um, you know, nudie branks are great. You can sit there, they're beautiful, they're colorful. Um, but for me, you know, I, I love the challenge of a moving subject and trying to capture their personality. And, you know, this is a pretty typical standard shot. And, um, you know, the other thing I would, bit of tip i always put about is think about who your audience is am i trying to appeal to a photo uh, to a diver that is seeing these subjects and, and understand what they are or am i trying to shoot for someone that doesn't understand the ocean and and try to get them in, interested in in photography or interested in underwater and going through diving so the style of photography i do and the way i frame is, is very different based on audience but with these um you know squid are actually if anyone's tried to ever photograph them can be a really really tricky subject to expose mainly because they've got these dishes of eyes which are like little mirrors um so you know your strobe positioning is really really important and your exposure is really, really tricky because you'll probably find you come out with images where the eyes are completely blown out, which you can't recover in post. And yeah, you might have a nice body. So my, my number one tip for squid is underexpose, get your, get your strobes not directly in front, get them out and kick them out and wide and start going in. And then I, you know, really it's, I want to. It's so often the decision that you have to consciously make is overexposed or underexposed and and squid and all these guys are absolute candidates for underexposing um because how many times have you come out and be like oh i got a killer shot like yours with the three squid you know and then the first one just has complete white eyes like oh, and nothing you can do about it um, exactly. but particularly if you're full framing you really always should underexpose these guys whereas other things you should overexpose yeah, totally. And, and you know, they, these days, modern cameras, their dynamic range, um, you've, you've got a, a fair bit to kick in. Um, yeah, within limit, um, obviously, if you're doing a photo, <laughs> again, think about what you're shooting and what you're shooting for. If you're shooting for competition, you, you obviously need to understand your tolerances of how much is allowed around, you know, moving the dials. Um, so that's something you've got to keep in mind. Um, so there you want to really get it in camera as best as you can. There it's about strobe positioning and everything else so that you've got your 25% tolerance so you're not getting getting through the getting the, the finals call and getting that disappointed I never got through the next stage because it wasn't, you know, it was deemed as over-edited. So, you know, do really, I think, take out time to really think about your strobe positioning, whether hitting the light and so on. 
but again, you know, for me, uh, you know, I want to go back to that photo, typical front on, typical sort of nice portraiture sort of photo, nice, nice background there with two other supporting squid. But then when we get nice and tight and look at different angle, I really love shooting upwards, right? It gets captures a unique kind of uh, character of, 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 of these squids. And, and, and if you know squids too, you're going to have some that are players, some that are not players, some as soon as you approach with the light. They take <coughs> off. You get others that come in and want to hang out with you, and this, this fellow is one of those. Now, I'm like Susan. Uh, I love uh, isolation and, and negative space, but I also love seeing a bit of uh, contrast in the background, a bit like Simon's shot uh, of that octopus pulling something here. So this is actually a squid directly underneath. Uh, shooting straight up uh, and you can see that kind of lit up at the background the sparkles they're actually from my bubbles uh, up on the surface uh, and being lit up by the strobe so again just creates a different isolation makes this really go to another another planet almost and makes it unearthly you know again is this going to be when i show a photo of this to someone who's not a diver or not a photographer it takes them a long time to understand this is, what is this? Where was it shot? Um, so, you know, I typically find black background equals confusion for non-divers. Uh, blue backgrounds automatically, they go, oh, I'm in the ocean. This is going to be something, you know, it, it takes them to that place pretty quickly. Now, this is a, a combination of bit similar to... Oh, I'm getting feedback. Sorry, Alan. I might need to go back on mute, Alan. Thanks, mate. So this is a combination of what Simon spoke about too around long exposure, uh, similar to, to, his, uh, to his last image, is here I'm using a long exposure technique. I've got a freeze frame happening with the strobe directly actually underneath and shooting up, which has kind of exposed the eye. Um, but then I've kind of made it a bit psychedelic, um, which isn't my usual style uh, to go this extreme, but I kind of like it how it came out. Uh, using a very long exposure with a video light coming uh, coming directly above as well to kind of combine. So you can see I've got the sharpness on the eye. You know, the tentacles are kind of nice and sharp through, but then a nice movement. And then obviously the body is just popping this color. Um, so something a little bit different to, to create a, uh, yeah, something a little bit unique for, for a squid shot. What do you think you shot that at? Uh, off memory, I think that was around one-tenth one tenth of a second um yeah and i had a I had a yeah one tenth to me is that magic number uh even for macro and, and for wide angle to get to capture some movement um particularly when you've got a, a good strong video light on this which which i had a did you move, did you move the did you move the camera no th that was purely that's all the squid uh that's the squid's movement at that point yeah so uh, um, the, the squid was kind of just hovering up and down a little bit. So that, that allowed to get that movement without me having to go with it. There's obviously other times uh, where, you know, I've done stuff with, with blue bottles and everything else. And yeah, your movement, you really introduce with the camera, not, not the, not the subject. Um, Brett, are you also using rear curtain shutter with that? No, that was front. That was front, not rear. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, the other side, I kind of call these shots like, um, whilst, you know, nice shot, nothing too unique or special about it. But what I like to talk about these photos is, is thinking about single light source. So a lot of us are uh, tuned into, I bought two strobes. I've got to always use them. Here it's, it's done in an isolation. It's not quite a snoot. I've used a restrictor on, on the retro uh, strobe to, to, you know, narrow the beam. This was taken in full daylight. Um, I, I like to talk about really look at lighting as part of the art form uh, and controlling it, narrowing it in many different ways, direction, so on, intensity. Um, but a good way to kind of look, I call this like a Mona Lisa shot. If you go and look at Mona Lisa as a painting and go back and look at it consciously now, thinking about lighting. And when you think of painting, most people don't think of lighting, but actually it's very, very prominent in portrait uh, painting go back and look at the, the picture of Mona Lisa and take a real note of the single light source and how it's coming across. And that's really what sets that painting into a league of its own. So again, think about that in your photography. Now, this is one of my favorite, favorite subjects. Um, and yeah, yeah this, 
so know, these, so bad. <laughs> yeah, we've been really lucky over the last couple of years to be getting thousands of these washing up on our local local beaches. Um, and, and I've got a whole new series. Uh, but this one was shot um, six and a half years ago. I, I got out of hospital the day before and was in, not in a good shape, but heard they were there, got into a rock pool and, and managed to capture this shot. And what's different about this shot for every Glaucus photo I'd ever seen before, so this is called a Glaucus. It's a part of the nudibranch family. They float on the surface and you're actually seeing the underside, which is normally the bit that floats on the surface and they're counter shaded and everything else. Uh, really amazing little animal. But this shot, every Glaucus photo, amazing Glaucus photo I'd seen um, and even had one underwater photo comps, weren't actually underwater photos. They were a uh, yeah, because they float on the surface, Maybe people are taking a photo from the top and light it up and nice. I wanted to get a shot of it underwater uh, with a reflection. And this is actually, it started doing uh, backflips. And so I happened to capture that moment as it just came back up to the surface and paused and created this angel sort of movement. And hence why you can then kind of see its face right up against the uh, the underside. So it's a very, yeah, it's, a, it's a mind bend of a photo, but um yeah, pretty, pretty cool, but very difficult to be shooting on the surface. And speaking of shooting on the surface. Love the yeah. symmetry on that. It's it, like. Yeah, got, got pretty lucky. Everything just lined up. And it's that split second, right? As I said, it's doing it's doing these back rolls and somersaults and then all of a sudden just stops. What time, what time what of the year is that? Uh, for us, I think this was normally around... Uh, February, March, we, we get a get a the stream of these. Uh, we're actually got a little citizen science project at the moment, trying to track and predict them. Um, so yeah, my wife's kind of running that project. It's pretty cool. Very very amazing animal. And this is a, a set of uh, well, this photo is a, of a baby seahorse. Um, this is a couple of day old seahorse here. We're talking less than less than a centimeter. Um, well under an inch for those in, in the US. So a very small animal, a couple of days old. Um, amazing uh, experience down in, in Victoria, cold water diving, um, actually not even diving, snorkeling for this photo. Um, but again, you know, I really love uh, playing around with mirroring um, near the surface. So it's fine. It's a, it, that, that surface is explored very much in free diving, very much in, 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 in wide angle photography. But I actually think there's a there's a whole world of really untapped into macro photography around where the two worlds meet, the underwater and the top side. Hence, the Glaucus is on the top side. I've got a whole series around blue bottles, but also wanted to introduce these seahorses that that kind of float around right near the surface as their young babies in this little um, this little uh, pier down in Victoria. So yeah, pretty lucky to be able to getting it right up on the surface, isolate it from a quite a lot of. Um, richness in the water a lot of food uh but was pretty lucky to kind of capture this you, um, are you on a snorkel here because i always find if i forget a snorkel then you know the bubbles keep like ruining the 100 percent. yeah and that's um absolutely this is on snorkel um yeah you, you try to do this on scuba um even funny enough i remember about 10 minutes before taking this photo um some guys on some some uh, ccrs came underneath us and there's one of them just off gassed at that very second and i was about to take photos so very small bubbles compared to open circuit scuba but still a little bit of a bubbles and i'm about to shoot and actually i had about a I had a float of about uh, eight seahorses on a piece of uh, of seagrass and next minute it just started flying around everywhere so you're having a snorkel understanding your environment um and you know i, I went down to victoria to, to do a dive trip and i ended up um dived once found the seahorses were on and i did nothing else for that week except sit in the water for seven hours on snorkel to capture these images so you kind of got to sometimes you got to give up the emotional thing hey i'm on a dive trip or are you going after a particular image or experience right and and be prepared to ditch ditch the scuba gear go old school and chuck a snorkel on right <laughs> Um, it is hey, yeah can i ask you a question you you've mentioned blue bottles a couple of times and i don't know what you're referring um, to like a uh, the portuguese man of war um okay. so yeah yeah that's what you mean but all right that's good I, now uh, yeah. i did I, I did have some photos in here but i ended up culling uh 
<laughs> it's a couple of minutes before we started the Brezzo. I should have, should have left one in there. Um, the other side, and you mentioned this before, eye contact is really key. But again, I also do think introducing eye into the background, um, this gives perspective to non-divers right now, right? Because when you show macro photography, again, non-divers don't really appreciate how small of that subject is and, and its uniqueness. So, you know, introducing a diver in the background and their eye um, just slightly, obviously, the focus here is still very much about the eye of the animal, but I want to introduce a background element uh, while still being, being natural. You know, um, I think that's something you want to look at. And, and, and again, we go back to the, my favourite, oh, the, the little seahorses. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that to me, um, again, I, I, I've got a, a similar photo to here, black background. I've actually got a photo with 24 seahorses on a single piece of uh, seaweed. It's really nice, really unique. But when you introduce a human element into it, um, this, again, gives perspective of size, um, everything. Like, to me, uh, this, without this photo of my wife in the background, and she's very good at getting the right position for macro photography after years of pushing around and everything else to get in the right spot, she knows exactly what to do. It's great. And we're able to capture an image like this together. So, um, yeah, again, don't be afraid to think, you know, think your background, think your subject. It's two photos, two exposures, two photos. And that's what I think creates uh, a little bit more of a unique photo. But that, that to me is... Um, it, it, the image. Pink, the, yeah. snorkel, the snorkel is too dominant, that, that, that pink... I know. I do. I do have another shot where I've got plenty of other shots with no snorkel in, and I do prefer them. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, but there's only like, and I say only, there's only about twelve seahorses in the photo, so it's not enough seahorses. I wanted to show. Oh, them. oh wow! <laughs> so to me, this was kind of pulling it all together. Um, but yeah, you are right that the snorkel does, which sometimes you want that right—a bit of contrast against the black wetsuit and so on. Um, but at least it does distract a little bit. Um, but yeah, I can, so, I mean, I'll show you other photos later. <laughs> wow. And that's me. Um, yeah, really. Thanks to ADEX. Alan, thanks for hosting us. Um, yeah, so I'm, I love, love, love the set of images today and, uh, feel free to hit us up and look forward to chatting. Yes. Thank you for having me too. I appreciate it. It's very nice to be here and yeah. nice to get to meet you folks and Alan and, uh, Simon. We'll, we'll be doing some more with Simon soon. Brett, I'm going to have to talk to you some more <laughs> for sure. <laughs> likewise. Likewise. Thank you. Yes, yeah, from my side as well. Great hanging out. Well, yeah, I'm back. And I just like to thank all of you for taking the time today to join us and share your amazing photographs with us. Super blown away by so many of the images I've seen today. And I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but the ADEX show is happening and it's finally back after two years. And it's happening on the 16th to the 18th of September this year in Singapore. So I really hope to see you guys in person at the show. And for our viewers, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them on our Facebook page and we'll try our very best to answer them. Stay tuned for the next session happening shortly. Why live about diving with Mark Brodison? So thank you once again, Simon, Brett, Susan, and Alan for joining us today. And I hope to see you soon. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.